Tate Gallery. She's done some really impressive stuff. So I'm sure we're in for quite a treat now. So everyone give her a big round of applause. So a UI that rocks. What can she possibly mean by that? And above all, how can something called Gestalt possibly have any practical application? But hopefully, we'll find out. Let's see if I can use the ticker. Yeah, okay. So I think it's always good to start with a classic crowd please, uh, pleaser, I'm sure you'll agree. So this is a legendary website. I think some of you will be familiar with it. And it's been topping the charts of the worst website ever, I think for well over a decade by now. So it's got everything, absolutely everything. It's got animations, it's got the Paisley background, it's got drop shadows, it's got music, it's got everything. And quite frankly, you know, I would actually say that the UI of this website kind of does rock because, you know, hats off to Ling, who's actually built a thriving business on the basis of this website, as a slap in the face of all of us design snobs, quite frankly. <laughs> so, so um, I think we'd all agree that this website is, however, a bit of a mess. But I'd be interested to see, what would you say that is, if you had to pinpoint one thing that absolutely doesn't work with this website, what would you say that it is? If it was only one thing that you could say. Yeah, white space is one, yeah. The but colour. What's he selling? Colour flashes. Yeah, that's... Yeah, exactly. So, qu sorry? Flow. Flow. Yeah, flow is another one, yeah. Yeah. But um, I think there's one... I mean, all absolutely valid remarks, but I think there's one thing that is the main problem that kind of encompasses all of the other problems. So the main problem with the design of this website is that there is too much going on. It's basically made of lots of details and I don't know what I'm looking at. So there are also elements that we try and interpret as, as meaning something or belonging to the same category because they share features. Like for instance, the pink headings, I thought, oh, okay, so the pink headings are actually Spanish cars, but actually, no, they're not, because the spider is Italian, it's also pink. So, um, without going too much into detail with analysing this website, I think we can agree that this user interface is not very easy to use. And this is mainly because our brain tends to perceive, tends to perceive scenes as a whole first, and then interpret the details later. So when the details are the main feature, which is exactly what happens here, our brain goes into cognitive overload and we don't like it. Also, I think it's, it's fair to say that it would, it would actually be easier to build an, an user interface that makes sense rather than try and reproduce the kind of, you know, weird magic that this website has. Because <laughs> not all of us have the same kind of brazen genius that it takes to just build a website like this and get away with it and actually, you know, make money out of it. So, as we are mere mortals and not maverick geniuses like, like uh, Ling, I think that what we'd, we would all like to do is create a user interface that leads to a smooth and easy user experience, avoiding brain overload. So, paraphrasing the title of a famous book, a UI that rocks is actually a UI that doesn't make your users think. And this is where Gestalt principles come into play. So, can you see what this is straight away? Immediately? Yeah, so what is it? Because it, actually I didn't. <laughs> Dalmatian doing what? Would you say you can tell what he's doing? Sort of sniffing the ground, you know. I always had a shady forest because of the sort of dotted uh, shadows. So, at first sight though, this image may seem like an agglomerate of, of black blobs. I think I need to learn how to hold this because it makes a difference. Anyway, um, so our eye soon recognizes the emerging shape of a Dalmatian stiff, sniffing the ground in a shady forest. So our eyes and brain perceive the scene as a whole without needing to analyze the details. We can do that, but we do it, we do it only, la only later. So we notice the details 
only after we've identified at the outline. So the Gestalt theory of vision is based on the premise that we see the whole before the details, basically. So the Gestalt principle des describes the various ways in which we economize brain power, basically, and avoid cognitive overload. So Gestalt is a German word that can be translated as form or shape or sometimes even pattern. There is actually no precise uh, English equivalent. So, and it's a Western theory of psychology that was uh, created in the early 19th century in Germany, in Berlin, by um, three psychologists called uh, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kofka and Wolfgang, Wolfgang Köhler. Excuse my German. Um, they, uh, there were many more that then added to it. I mean, you know, this is, by the way, it's just a, an introduction that's useful to us because this is a huge kind of branch of, of, of science and, and, and so on. So, um, and the Gestalt principles describe how the human eye perceive visual elements and how complex images tend to be reduced uh, to simple shapes. And the story goes that in 1911, Max Wertheimer purchased a toy stroboscope, which is, I'm told, a mechanical device that produces um, uh, images that alternate and create different effects. So because they, they, uh, the theory that they were sort of um, part of at the time that was called structuralism didn't allow for that. So they thought, oh, we, better, we better create a theory that actually does study this type of phenomenon and takes it into account. Uh, so that's, that's how it all started. So according to Gestalt, when the human eye perceives a scene, it uses underlying principles uh, of organization so that we can understand what's before us with minimal effort. And that seems to be the sort of the overarching thing that we want to make as little effort as, as possible. And and that's the way that we do that is that we see a whole object before its component parts. For instance, when we see a car, we, we don't see the single bits that make the car. We don't see the wheels or the doors or the windows or the bonnet. We see the car as a whole first. And then only if necessary do we notice the details. So the leading principle uh, for, of the theory of Gestalt is that the whole is other than the sum of its parts. So again, this means that we identify whole meaningful objects immediately and without conscious effort, like we, like we, um, you know, we did with the car, we do with cars, or we even people, and like we don't do so easily with Ling's website, um, basically. So the human eye also perceives a unified shape in a different way to how it perceives uh, the individual parts that, uh, that form it. So the interesting thing is that many of the design principles that we, we follow arise out of Gestalt theory, in fact, when they don't arise out of Western art and Western art theory. And I think Western is, is important to stress, but anyway. So, but that's a different story, the, what, the, the role that art plays in, um, in design. So um, some of the Gestalt principles are more relevant to web design than, than others. And some are more specific, maybe more useful for graphic design rather than design of web pages. So we'll have a look at the sort of most important underlying ones and then we'll have a look at the ones that, in my opinion, really help. And probably a lot of us are already sort of um, unconsciously or instinctively using already anyway. Um, so here's the dog again. So the Gestalt principle at play here is called emergence. And again, the shape of the dog emerges. And uh, emergence occurs when simple shapes arranged together can create a more complex image, the outline of which emerges from the scene before its, its uh, details. So thanks to, to this ability, we economize brain power and we avoid cognitive overload. So basically our brains is constantly begging us not to make it think too hard. And that's what a lot of Gestalt principles describe. So basically let's try and do that with our users is the point. So the main takeaway for web design from the principle of emergence is that 
the overall appearance of an element must always take precedence over the details. So, which is what Ling's website obviously doesn't do. So shapes and contours are more important than lesser details. So it really doesn't matter how cool you know, a button looks if the users are, don't understand it's a button because they're distracted by the details. So very simply put, don't be too clever or too ornate if it doesn't help your users. Now, here's another, you might have seen this image before. What, what animal do you see? Rabbit. <laughs> Duck, rabbit. Robert Duck. Okay, I think both camps are uh, equally represented. So uh, clearly, there's two two images here. So when an image can be interpreted in two different ways, our minds will alternate between the two interpretations, but we can't see the two views at once. And this. Um, it's impossible for us to see the two images at once, basically. And this principle is called multi-stability. And it occurs when an image can be interpreted in, interpreted in two different ways, but our mind can only see one view at once. And the interesting thing is that it really is out of our conscious control. We can't predict who will see a rabbit first and who will see a duck. And I, for instance, I see the, I see the duck first and I, I simply can't help that. And even if now you can see both, because those of you who could see the bunny can now see the duck, but still you can't see them both at the same time. So multi-stability in general should be avoided in web design unless you, yes, I can, I can see your reaction. So unless you have, unless you are, being extremely clever and you're able to resolve it successfully and above all meaningfully unless it has a reason you should really really avoid it so this is a typical example of a clever design because it obviously this is animated in the real world but it, it doesn't do anything doesn't add anything to to the experience in any way and if you move the mouse actually things happen that don't particularly resolve the multi-stability, and I actually feel really unsafe because I don't know what's what's going on. However, it's it's just this is a typical something that, that I find personally because I I come from print, so it's typical of designers who come from print that you want to do things that look cool and that are exciting, but actually don't really help the user very much. So this is very creative design, but we need. To, I've had, I mean I speak for myself. I've had to learn to curb my excitement and be less clever and less because this is if anyone's here is worked in has worked in print they know what what's going on here and you know it's it's not um i always now ask myself before i make something look pretty i ask myself whether it's going to be visible by everyone and whether it's going to help the the user and by the way this is a fantastic agency and they do really really creative work so it's not a judgment on their work but on this particular sort of piece of of uh, thinking. So the main takeaway for web design from the principle of multi-stability that don't make them think, once again, avoid ambiguity or information overload in your UI. Usability tests are your friend. So when we're too close to a design, sometimes we don't realize that some of the elements in the UI look too similar, for instance. So don't make a button look like a heading because it's just going to confuse the users or you know, make sure that your colors are meaningful, meaningfully used and so on. So make sure that there cannot be a double interpretation. And if there's no, you know, this, get things tested. And when there's no budget for usability tests, simply just get a fresh pair of eyes on your design. Get a friend or anyone to test your, uh, your UI and make sure that there are no, there's no possibility of double interpretations. Now, if you look at the object in the, on the top left, I think we can all agree that it's, there's a triangle there, even though actually the triangle is not drawn, it's only implied. And the same applies to this sort of hand grenade kind of thing. There's a, I can definitely see a sphere there, but it's actually not drawn. Same with a Loch Ness uh, monster there. And I think that that's a fat snake around the pole, something like that. Um, anyway, so these are shapes that are only implied and not drawn, but still we see them. So even when we have only a partial vision of an object's uh, contour, we are able to come to a conclusion as to its, its shape. We can complete the shape in our mind. 
So this Gestalt principle is called reification. The word reification come, comes from the Latin res, which means object or thing. thing. And it, it, um, it's the ability of our visual perception to create complete representation, even on the basis of limited visual information. By the way, if you look at the uh, triangle up there, can anybody see something else apart from the uh, triangle? Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely, Pacman. So I think that here we've also got, once again, an, an example of multi-stability at play. So you see already how Gestalt principles, can, you can see two in one. So it's Pacman as well as, uh, as the triangle. This is an example of using reification or web design. This is also, there's another Gestalt principle at play here, but this, we all know that these are circles even though we can't see the whole, the whole object. So the main takeaway for web design from the principle of reification is that your users' minds can fill in the gaps. So be bold using white space as a design tool. Now, here's a face, a face that looks very different in each image. Uh, but I think that most of us know who this is. We can all recognize him. Because as human beings, we've got the ability to recognize objects or faces regardless of um, deformations and variations in scale, in elastic deformations, uh, uh, color deformations, and other, and other characteristics. So in the case of a, of a human face, even though uh, the c hair color might change or the length or the facial hair or the inevitable signs of aging, we can still, we can still rec recognize them. This principle is called invariance. And thanks to the principle of invariance, we're basically able to experience the world without having to perpetually reassess a constantly changing scene. So again, invariance allows us to minimize our cognitive efforts when we interact with the world. And again, invariance helps us to not think. So a practical example of the use of invariance in web design is capture, which is evil, as we all know, it's terrible, but that's, that's where it's used. But as humans, we can, we can read this. Or almost, or sometimes not at all, but anyway. Um, so the main takeaway from the principle of invariance for web design is that, for now, it's the edge that the human brain has over bots, basically. Um, on the web, it's typically used in, in capture. For now, that's, that's, it's an edge we have over UI. So, as we've said, these are some of the sort of fundamental uh, principles of uh, Gestalt. Now, we're going to have a look at the most relevant ones for web design, in my opinion, and that I could fit in half an hour, because there are many and it's a big, it's a big um, discipline. So, isolating individual elements from a background is an ability that came in very useful for our ancestors when they had to detect a predator in the field. So, and this is called the principle of figure ground organization, which basically is the ability to focus on one part of a scene, filtering out the elements that are not necessary to us. So in this case, we, can, we know that the lion is the most important element in, element in this scene, even though it's, it's quite small, but you know, basically it's, it's survival. So the most important element in a scene appears as in front of everything else and the rest sort of blurs back because it's not as important. For instance, in, on this web page, it's immediately clear to me that the, the, what I'm required to do here is fill in the form because the, fill, the form is white and really stands out against a, a rather busy uh, background, so I'm immediately able to identify it, and basically I'm made to not think. It's made clear to me that I should do this because it's so, you know, stands out so clearly. So the main takeaway for web design from the uh, principle of figure ground organization is to make sure that the most important part of a UI stand out clearly against the background. Now, sometimes when I say all these things, I think. Isn't that obvious? But the thing is that it's, it's not. I mean, in, 
it, it should be, but it's not always, especially when you go around the web and, and look at things. You're like, what? You know, you get quite confused. So, um, also interestingly, and actually, um, I just went to this super interesting talk about uh, accessibility, and it made me think. So, for instance, when when you have black writing against a white background, that source of figure ground organization. Basically, any time that something that stands out. But it, it made me think again how it's good to have all these tools in our arsenal and use them with a real, a really conscious approach because it makes you think seriously about, well, maybe I shouldn't use white text. Maybe that's too much stand out, you know, that maybe the background stand out too much. So it's also it's really important to... to um, consider these things. And this particular Gestalt principle is used in photography a lot. So all the, the trend of using a very shallow depth of field with the subject in sharp relief and the background blurred. You know, plenty of Instagram filters that do that. Now we're getting in it, into the so-called uh, grouping laws that I think are the ones that we use a lot, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, when we design our web pages. Um, so the human eye has the tendency to group together elements based on certain uh, things. In this case, we group together the elements that have certain, that share certain features, like shape, color, and size. So we tend to think that all the pink arrows pointing up pertain to the same group, whereas the uh, white arrows pointing down, we put in a different group that probably, possibly has even a different meaning or a different function. This principle is called the law of similarity and uh, occurs when the, because the human eye groups together elements that share similar features. And uh, I think that this is probably something that you know, we, we apply a lot or should, basically. <laughs> so, um, we, for instance, on this page from the uh, agency uh, Studio Diva, all these different shapes of the logos of the clients that they worked with uh, are resolved really well because they all share a similar size and, and the same color. So there's no, um, so they're unified. We immediately understand that they, they mean, you know, they, put, they belong to the, same, to the same group. So if they'd been left in their original color, I think it would have reached the Ling effect because there would have been too much fighting for our attention and it would have been made of too many, too many details. So, um, the main takeaway for web design from the law of similarity is that UI elements that perform a similar function or belong to the same group should always share one or more visual feature. This, uh, in this slide we see how we, uh, our brain naturally perceive objects that are close to one another as belonging to the same group. And this is called the principle of proximity. So the human eye groups together elements that are close to one another in space. So again, this is used very often in, in our uh, user interfaces, like for instance on this page, where we see clearly, we immediately understand that the, um, uh, on the top right we, we have the navigation, uh, which the elements are all clearly grouped together. And we also see the law of similarity at play here that tells us that all belong to the same group because they share font size, color, and uh, weight. And also, interestingly, we also know that probably uh, there's something going on with the, with the blog page. We're probably on it because it has a different color from the other ones. So again, you can use the principles also uh, to differentiate things because uh, we see the law of proximity at play also in the fact that the uh, logo sits all, all the way back to the... Uh, on the other end, so that means that it belongs to a different group. Again, the, the main takeaway for web design from the law of proximity is that make sure that elements that belong to the same group are placed in close proximity. Again, obvious, now have a look around the web and maybe not so obvious, not all the time. In this case, we'll see how items that share the same clearly delineated region of space belong together. With the law of proximity, we probably would have thought that the, the dots on the left actually belong to the same group, but I think we tend to group together the ones in the, in the white square before because there's this very, very clear uh, regional demarcation. So this is called the law of common region. Um, 
and it's again very very useful to use and to use uh, wisely so we apply it to many uh, areas of our designs, often in the navigation as well. Uh, an example is here in this Facebook post where it's used in, in everywhere. It's used in the top because uh, that those bits uh, mean something. Uh, it's used in the box itself, in the whole box, because it's a white box against a gray background. Uh, the learn more button is a use of the lower common reg region and so on. So the main takeaway for web design, again, is make your UI easy to use by placing groups of elements within the same clearly defined uh, region of space. Here, the cuddly panda of this logo is clearly a panda, even though there's uh, some information missing. The shapes are not resolved. And this principle is called uh, the principle of closure. And again, it's, it's, it builds on the principle of reification that we saw earlier and it's when our mind supplies the missing information for incomplete shapes and even though it's used maybe a little bit more in in uh, logo design but it's also used in web design a lot for instance if you see this box from the guardian newspaper you can see that it's used for instance here in the categories the box is not complete but um but we clearly perceive the box as 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 a box even though it's got lines missing. And actually, here there are quite a few more principles of Gestalt at play, which I would say, for instance, here you get figure ground organization. Uh, you get that also in the red headlines. It clearly means something else. That's also uh, similarity because you make it different, so you, it's clear that it means something else. So once you start getting familiar with it, you start really seeing it at play in, uh, in many different places. The main takeaway from the law of closure is that minimal designs can really help your UI by avoiding visual overloads. Again, let your users fill, fill in the gaps and white space, again, very, very important. The human eye is accustomed to recognizing pathways and following them, going with the flow, as it were, following paths, even when, even when the lines are not complete, because here's not complete, it's dots that actually don't complete the, the line, but we know that that's, that's a line, a flow that we follow. This is a called, the, it's called the law of continuation, and according to it, the eye perceives the path as a continuous flow. And I, this is uh, an example of the law of continuation at play. So when we ask Google to uh, give us information about uh, a walking route, this is what we get. And we know that that is a, a continuous line that we need to follow even though it's, it's dotted. And I really, I don't know if you agree with me, but to me this is terrible because I, it's always, the dots are on top of the name of the street. So I can't read it. And then when I'm out in the wild and I'm trying to read like I can't see it I don't I can't believe that it's never occurred to anyone and then also the dot that represents you is blue I mean why you know I want to be yellow so um, that's again figure ground organization if you were using figure ground organization then you would make me the you know the yellow dot and you would maybe move the the, the blue dots that follow so I can actually read the name of the street which might be useful you know with that kind of thing so there are many, many more Gestalt principles that apply to, to the, or can apply to web design. So again, this is my, <laughs> what did I say was funny? I hadn't, I actually didn't realize. No, right, never mind. Um, so um, yeah, so this is basically, it's a basic selection. As promised, it's an introduc introduction and there's much, much more. But I hope, I think that you can really see how you know, I think that unconsciously we all do it, but if, if, it, if you do it consciously, then I think that this kind of approach can really, really, really help improve that UI. And ex actually, it helps you know, explain to the clients why the logo can't be bigger, giving them actual reasons that go beyond design, design snobbery, you know, which is, I think, very, very helpful. So, and also, I think that you will... No, now you will start, if you, if you sort of start looking at designs on the web that you see that don't work, you'll be able to actually 
analyze why you know give an, a, a bit more of a reason as to why it does you know it doesn't work for you which i think is helpful above all if i had to say there was one main takeaway from gestalt psychology for web design is don't make them think that's it okay Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. I really, really enjoyed the oh, talk. Um, I wondered if there's any uh, kind of further reading you'd recommend for any kind of like more deeper dives into Gestalt and web design. Yeah, there's a fantastic um, web, um, online learning center, which is called the um, Interaction Design Foundation. Uh, IDF, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's not just, it's for this and for general, generally for UX and UI, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that excellent talk. Thank um, you. We've heard a lot at this conference about accessibility, and you've yeah. talked a lot about minimal design and minimal UI, and obviously there could be a conflict there between making a site work for people who are hard of seeing or colorblind and minimal design which takes away a lot of elements it seems and could make things more difficult so how do you resolve those difficulties i think that's a really interesting question because i would say that actually it's the opposite i would say that accessibility is about making things as simple as possible and that's why for me it was such a it has been such a big shift coming from a print background um you know, working for a, make, doing film posters that you know, have to be as complex as possible sometimes. So, uh, and coming to the web where uh, it wasn't about that at all in the slightest. So when I, if I try and design with accessibility in mind, which I try and do more and more and more these days, I have to, I have to admit that it's not all, it's about making things simpler. So I think that actually taking away will always make the experience easier because you stop thinking about what looks pretty like for instance I have an obsession with making my links look cool <laughs> really it's just something that I spend I can spend a weekend on mm. but it's then I realized do something else you know go sk skating go, go swimming because it's it's just put a line under it you know so I I, I would say that it's it's the opposite thank you very much Brilliant speech, uh, absolutely you. fantastic. And um, clearly there's a lot that I've not understood. I, I realize a lot of it we do tend to do unconsciously. Where, where's your background in this? Is this from print yourself? Have you studied it? I, uh, well, uh, by training, I'm actually, um, I'm actually an art historian. So I do know that when I started being a designer, which was many, many years ago, um, I was applying a lot of Western, as like I said, Western art theory uh, to, to my designs. But actually then, because of trying to be, to get the UI better, because of trying to uh, understand and make my UX better rather than doing, making pretty things, that's when I, I, I realized, I don't know how it came into my consciousness, but I thought, wow, Gestalt, is, I knew about it. I knew about Gestalt, um, Gestalt uh, therapy. Uh, and then I realized that actually, as it starts, it, it, it starts from vision, for the, from the human eye, from human perception. And have you seen the, you know, uh, the Mexico Olympics 1968? Have you seen the iconography that they did? I, it, it rings a bell, but I yeah. can't picture it. I was, I, I was going to ask as well if that was Gestalt or not, but uh, I'll catch up with you after. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I need, now I need to check. Now, oh, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Great, that was really good, thank you. Um, round of applause again. Woo